What if I told you that three tiny chains of amino acids called peptides could legitimately shift how your body ages after 30? Not magic, not biohacking hype, just smart physiology. Today I'm breaking down the science and the story of how these peptides went from obscure lab tools to something showing up in mainstream performance, longevity clinics, and recovery centers. And then I'll walk you through the top three peptides I think are most relevant for people 30 plus who want to feel sharper, stronger, and younger. Not in the fountain of youth, immortality sense, but in the real life sense of bouncing back from workouts, keeping muscle, having skin that holds up, and a metabolism that doesn't slow to a crawl. By the end, you'll understand what peptides are, why they matter more after 30, and how to talk to your doctor or clinic about them. If that's a path you're considering, quick disclaimer up front, this is education, not personal medical advice. Some peptides are FDA approved for specific medical uses. Others are experimental or outright unapproved for human use. I'll call that out clearly when we get there. So, peptides 101. What are they? In one breath, peptides are short chains of amino acids, the same building blocks that make proteins. But instead of building muscle or structure, peptides act as messenger molecules in the body. They say things like, repair this, release that, or grow now. If your cells are co-workers in a big company, peptides are the post-it notes and Slack messages telling different departments what to do and when. Past your late 20s, a bunch of those internal messages get quieter. Growth hormone signaling softens, protein synthesis slows, and your natural repair processes start dragging their feet. Collagen production dips. Joints start making commentary. Peptides can nudge those pathways. Not by forcing the body, but by amplifying messages that have gotten harder to hear. And the history here is actually great. Peptides aren't new. Insulin is a peptide hormone discovered over a century ago, and it changed medicine. Later, researchers mapped hypothalamic releasing hormones, the tiny peptides that instruct your pituitary, and that opened the field of modern endocrine medicine. The peptides we talk about today in performance and recovery are part of that same family lineage. It's like your body already speaks a language with words like repair, grow, regenerate. With age, the microphone gets fuzzy. Peptides don't invent a new language, they just upgrade the mic. And when used well, the aim is not to override your biology, but to restore clarity to systems that have gotten a little hard of hearing. Now, how did peptides go from medical specialty land to something your trainer or physical therapist might mention? For years, peptides lived mostly in pharmaceutical use, diabetes care, fertility, rare disease treatments, then three shifts happened. Scientists improved peptide design so they last longer and target better. Delivery methods got better at surviving your body's enzyme shredders. And AI-assisted drug discovery started identifying promising peptide sequences faster. Suddenly, peptides began showing up not just in metabolic or endocrine clinics, but in wound healing research, oncology, vaccine platforms, and even targeted drug delivery. A big 2025 review summed it up nicely. Modern peptides are more stable, more specific, and more clinically useful because we've learned to armor them and direct them. More signal where you want it, less side noise. At the same time, performance and longevity communities started experimenting with peptide protocols for muscle repair, body composition, sleep, and skin regeneration. One popular example is combining CJC1295 with ipamorelin to support a natural growth hormone rhythm, something we're about to unpack. Important caveat here, popularity does not equal approval. Many of these uses are off-label. Some compounds are unapproved entirely. This is where nuance matters. So, let's keep it grounded. Why does any of this hit differently after 30? Because most of us are balancing training, career, stress, sleep, family, and actual life. Recovery needs to keep up peptides aren't magic. But used correctly, they act as smart amplifiers. Peptide plus lazy lifestyle equals nothing impressive. Peptide plus consistent training, protein intake, and sleep. That's where synergy shows up. Now let's talk about three peptides that come up most often for people over 30. The first is CJC1295, combined with ipamorelin. This is the double play. What these do, in plain English, 
They support your body's own growth hormone rhythm, especially your nighttime pulse. Instead of dumping growth hormone directly into the system, CJC-1295 is a modified version of GHRH, the hormone that taps your pituitary to release GH. Ipamorelin is a ghrelin receptor agonist that taps that same pathway from a different angle. Together, they encourage your body to release GH in pulses that resemble healthy physiology. Why does that matter in your 30s? Because this is when you start hearing the quiet opening whisper of sarcopenia, recovery takes longer, and workouts have a longer hangover. Growth hormone coordinates protein synthesis, tendon and collagen remodeling, and influences fat metabolism via IGF-1. The goal here is not to force growth, it's to get the foreman back on the job. What people report with this stack is usually subtle but meaningful. Less next day soreness, slightly faster bounce back from hard cycles of training, small but real influences on body composition, when protein and lifting are dialed in, and occasionally deeper sleep if nighttime GH pulses improve. Think 10 to 15% more resilient, not a movie montage transformation. Clinically, these are usually subcutaneous injections on structured cycles. Many clinicians use non-DAC CJC1295 to preserve the pulsatile rhythm. DAC versions last longer, but may flatten GH pulses. Monitoring usually includes IGF-1, fasting glucose and insulin, and thyroid markers, because these systems talk to each other. And we do need to acknowledge risks. Any GH axis modulation can cause fluid retention, joint tingling, glycemic changes, or theoretically stimulate hidden cancer growth because growth signals are growth signals. This is why responsible clinics screen and monitor. Also, athletes. Many of these compounds are prohibited in sport. And if you're thinking, should I even consider this? Here's the why not scenario. If you're already lifting consistently, eating 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram protein, sleeping seven to nine hours, and you want to reinforce recovery and lean mass, this may amplify the foundation you've built. If your base habits are chaos, focus there first. The peptide is the volume knob, not the speaker. Peptide number two is BPC-157, often called the duct tape peptide. It gets talked about for tendon and ligament repair, gut lining support, and general recovery. In animal studies, it looks incredible. Angiogenesis, fibroblast migration, collagen organization, all the choreography of tissue repair, for the 30-plus crowd who are starting to collect little injuries, this is understandably appealing. But here comes the big, necessary asterisk. High-quality human data is thin. BPC-157 is not FDA approved for any use. It is not a legal dietary ingredient. It appears on anti-doping unapproved substances lists. Buying vials online labeled for research only is risky and often illegal. If a clinic offers it, ask very direct questions about sourcing, sterility, and evidence, and treat it, if used at all, as a supplement to real rehab, not a replacement. Think. Load management, isometrics, progressive eccentrics, protein and collagen timing, and sleep. Sleep is the unpaid intern who actually runs your company. BPC-157, in the best case scenario, is the sauce, not the steak. Some people swear by its effects, others notice nothing. The main point, promising signals plus limited human evidence equals proceed with caution. Peptide number three, tesamorelin. This one is FDA approved, but for a very specific population. Adults with HIV associated lipodystrophy who have excess visceral abdominal fat. It's a GHRH analog that prompts the pituitary to release GH in a way that reduces visceral fat. It is not a general weight loss drug and not a general anti-aging therapy. So why is it in this conversation? Because tesamorelin shows, in randomized human trials, that targeted peptide signaling can reduce visceral fat and shift metabolic markers. It's one of the cleanest proofs of concept we have. But, and this is crucial, using it outside its label carries unknowns, especially for long-term cardiovascular health. If you ever encounter this peptide in a clinical context, it should come with labs, monitoring, and clear stop rules. That's responsible peptide use. So how do you think about all of this without going down a supplement rabbit hole? Here's the grown-up framework. First, define the job. 
If you want to improve recovery and maintain muscle, that's where conversations about CJC-1295 and ipamorelin make sense. If your joints or tendons keep derailing you, BPC-157 might enter the conversation, but comes with a caution banner because evidence is limited. If visceral fat is the concern, and you meet the clinical criteria, that's where tesamorelin makes sense, within its approved context. Second, build the system. Periodized training, progressive overload, deloads, proper protein intake, strategic collagen plus vitamin C for tendon work, real sleep, and actual recovery. Track metrics like strength numbers, lean mass via DEXA, or consistent impedance, waist circumference, HRV, and subjective sleep quality. Then, if you choose to use peptides, add them as amplifiers, not foundations. And always respect guardrails. No regulatory status. Avoid gray market sources. Use labs when touching the GH slash IGF-1 axis. And remember anti-doping rules if you compete. In summary, your physiology after 30 hasn't failed you. It has simply become less noticeable. Peptides are volume knobs for repair and metabolic messaging, not magic instruments. CJC-1295 plus epimorelin can support recovery, lean mass, and sleep by reinforcing GH rhythms. BPC-157 is a fascinating recovery idea with promising animal data but limited human evidence, so caution is warranted. Tesamorelin is FDA approved for a specific niche and shows how targeted signaling can reduce visceral fat, but it belongs firmly in monitored clinical use. If you talk to a doctor or clinic, good questions sound like this. My goals are recovery, body composition, and or joint resilience. Which, if any, peptide options fit my profile? What labs will we track? And what stop rules will we use if benefits aren't clear? What's the regulatory status of what you're prescribing? And how do you ensure sterility and sourcing? How does this integrate with my training, nutrition, and sleep plan over the next 12 to 24 weeks? Your body after 30 isn't broken, it has changed. But with the right signals, you can ask it to show up like a well-trained 30-something, not a 20-something chasing old glory stay curious. Stay strong. See you next time.